Yes, Mr. Hoskin. Commissioner, the next witness is Philip Bowden. Bowden. May I ask, Mr. Bowden, whether you'd prefer to make an oath or take an affirmation? Take an oath. Yes. Where the witness, please? Oh. Yep. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, Mr. Bowden. Do sit down. Yes, Mr. Hoskin. Uh, Mr. Mr. Costello, Bowden, sorry, I really <laughs> talk about slipper cock. Yeah. Um, your full name. One is of you is insulted. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to comment. Um, your full name is Philip Stewart Bout. That's correct. And your business address is Lot Six Ninety Three Chesterfield Circuit, Nalumboy. That's correct. And that's spelled N H U L U N B U Y. And you're a financial counsellor? That's correct. And you attend today in answer to a summons served on you by the Commission? That's correct. You have that summons? Yes, I do. I tend to that summons. Bit of 4.199. Summons to Mr Bowden. Mr Bowden, have you made a statement in answer to a request from the Commission? Yes, I have. And are the contents of that statement true and correct? They are. There just needs to be one correction. What's that correction? Uh, just the date. Um, this is on the first page. Yes, it is. There's no date in front of July. When did you sign that statement? Um, two days ago. Can I give you a hint and say yesterday? It was yesterday. Sorry. <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> Could you mark it with a four in front of July and initial that change, please? I'll ask you again, just to be certain, <coughs> with, that, with that amendment, are the contents of that correct or, that, that statement true and correct? Yes, 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 it is. I tend to that statement. Exhibit 4.200 will be the statement of Mr Bowden. Um, Mr Bowden, could you give the Commissioner some information about your work in community development before you came into your current role? <coughs> yes, I, um, uh, I lived overseas uh, in Cambodia. I did... Um, development work over there for um, uh, quite a, a long period of time, but that, uh, that in that time where I did uh, community development work and I was also a CEO of uh, International Cooperation Cambodia, which was a uh, conglomerate of a few agencies that had come together. I'd also uh, done a lot of voluntary work um, and uh, it helped start some <coughs> small NGOs there. Um, what have you done since you returned to Australia before your current role? Um, I returned back to uh, Sydney, Australia, and for two and a half years I worked for Salvation Army, and I was trained as a financial counsellor. You're a qualified financial counsellor? Yes, I am. And when did you start working for Anglicare NT? Uh, 2016. You live and work in East Arnhem Land? Yes, I do. What work does Anglicare NT do in East Arnhem Land? Um, we, um, we have a hub of uh, people that, uh, I'm the only financial counsellor in East Arnhem Land, but we also have uh, financial capability workers, and that <coughs> work entails going out to communities and um, helping with any financial issues, um, as well as um, education, um, things to that regard. Could you explain the difference between a financial counsellor and a financial capability worker? Uh, yeah, a financial counsellor is, um, uh, we have exemption through ASIC um, to talk about financial products, to um, talk about uh, debts uh, that you, uh, a client may have, and also um, you know, give advice and options on those debts. It could be, um, uh, could be you know, organising a payment plan for a client, it could uh, be talking about bankruptcy um, and, and information around that. So a financial capability worker has kind of restrictions on them. They're not allowed to talk about uh, those sorts of things, but they'll uh, look at budgets, they'll help people with forms, uh, those sorts of issues, and do a lot of education. Um, a financial capability worker is generally more concerned with uh, practical day-to-day -day matters of finance as opposed to giving advice yeah, sure. for longer term? 
Sure. Just uh, yeah, uh, um, simple issues or yeah, just uh, education around uh, how things work, especially uh, out in East Arnhem Land. There could be education regarding um, insurance. What, what is insurance? What does that mean? Um, it could be how bank accounts work. It could be uh, sure. helping to. Yeah. Um, Mr. Costello, pay. apparently the stream's down. I think. Yes, the stream is down, so uh, I might adjourn for a time to see if we can uh, get it going again. Uh, perhaps if uh, I say I'll come back at uh, quarter two or shortly before, unless I'm sent for earlier. Uh, quarter past. Uh, I'm having a good afternoon, <laughs> Mr Costello. I'm really having a good afternoon. Um, come back at quarter past unless I'm sent for earlier. Mr Bowden, just before we adjourned, you were giving some evidence about the different work done by financial counsellors as opposed to financial capability workers. Um, is it fair to say that part of the role of a financial counsellor is to build financial literacy? Yep, that's true. Um, so that clients are better able to look after their own financial affairs into the future? That's true. Yep. And, is that and, and make choices of what they, options that they want to um, carry out with um, their issues. Thank you. Uh, is that what you spend a lot of your time doing? Uh, no, no, not really. Not in East Arnhem Land. Why is that? Um, most of uh, East Arnhem Land is a little bit different. It's um, different from what I did in Sydney. <coughs> we have a lot of superannuation issues, um, a lot of questions about superannuation in East Arnhem Land. So that probably takes up probably 80% of my time. Are these questions um, by clients of yours that are trying to access their superannuation? Yeah, it could be a number of things. It could be um, accessing, getting close to their, or on their pre preservation age. Uh, it could be um, searches, searching for super. So we get a lot of Aboriginal people coming in trying to look for money. And it could be also like things like deceased estates. I see. And that occupies a lot of your time? Yeah, it's about 80%. So, um, <coughs> yeah, we're trying to work with the superannuation industry and, and advocate for, for changes, um, advocate that... Uh, Maybe just to encourage them to uh, look after their clients because obviously Aboriginal people have issues with identification and that was obviously brought up with uh, Linda Edwards uh, in the beginning of the week regarding those sorts of Aboriginal issues, trying to access the super or deceased estates, those sorts of things. And where in East Arnhem Land does Anglicare do work? Um, we, we do work, um, it, we have an office in Nullanboy. Um, and we have three people there, myself and two financial capability workers. And we also, uh, we go out from there on Cessnas to a lot of these remote locations. So we service places um, from Brood Island, uh, Numbawa, um, obviously the, the Go Peninsula, as well as um, I, I travel also out to Lake Avella, Gapawiak. Um, and we also have two Aboriginal staff in Ramagini. And we also travel to Millingimby and Elko Island, which is Gallowindwood. Um, one of the places you mentioned was Groot Island. Yep. You travel there by plane from Nullumboy. Yeah, we, uh, there is a service with Air North that does go there once a week. So I usually travel on a Tuesday to there. Usually spend four days, but usually have to get a charter back to back to Nullumboy. And uh, how often do you travel to Groot? I uh, try to get out there once, at least once a month. Okay. And does Anglicare have financial capability workers or worker on Groot Island? Yeah, they do do at the present. Yes, they do. That's just it. the one? Just the one. I see. And you work closely with that person? Yeah, I, I do. Yep. He will be leaving this month, though. Okay. Um, is retention of staff an issue? Yeah, it is because of the remoteness and a uh, uh, lot of transient work that goes on. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard to recruit and, and retain staff. Speaking of Groot Island generally, um, is Groot Island um, predominantly Indigenous? 
Uh, yes, there's a, a company called Gemco that is there, and they, they do some mining. Um, so there is an ANZ uh, branch there on the island. Um, and that's, it's around about 1,500, I think, Aboriginal people that live on the island. And how many towns are there on Groot? Uh, there's, uh, there's, there's three. There's three kind of main places. Okay. And do you work out of just one of them, or do you travel? Yes, I live in town. I stay in town, and then I'll, we travel out to uh, Nuragoo, and we'll, I usually try and at least get out to Macumba uh, once in a visit. All right. Um, speaking generally to the extent that you can, um, is there a range of financial literacy that you see in your clients on Groot? Would you say some people are quite financially literate and others are not very financially literate? Oh, yeah, there would be, you know, there's, there's obviously, um, you know, well-educated Aboriginal people there, but there's, there's also a, a huge a huge amount of uh, literacy is a, is a problem. Literacy and as well as um, financial literacy. Yes, I see. And um, are the people that you work most closely with generally um, on the lower end of the yeah, financial that's literacy correct. scale? that's correct. We, um, we kind of partner with... Other organisations, we, we have an office inside um, the Gibi office. It's, we kind of share resources, and uh, that's kind of like a work for the doll scheme. And so a lot of the uh, participants come into that, and uh, we get that cross um, you know, um, fertilisation of you know um, sharing clients and being able to do some literacy upstairs with them and those sorts of issues. Would it be uh, uncommon for one of your clients? to be unfamiliar with something like a minus symbol? Oh, yes, yes, that is, yep. That, that, uh, in my witness statement, I think I've... I said I did come across a client that had a... <coughs> came to me and said that she couldn't get her $200. I think it was around $200, and I tried to explain to her that was a minus symbol. And so I <coughs> just did some work on the board with her, you know. This is... It's, got, it's, it's an overdraft. You've used the bank's money, um, so you need to pay that back. So we did little, little education sessions around that and just showed her that, you know, once she pays the bank back its money, uh, then everything from zero up is, is, is yours. Right. Is English the first language of most of your clients? No. no it could, could quite easily be the third or fourth language. And is there any other bank on Groot Island? Would it be fair to say that a significant proportion of your clients would receive Centrelink payments? Ah, uh, yes. Okay. <coughs> you say in your witness statement that one of Anglicare's financial capability workers first raised with you that the accounts of the financial capability workers' clients were being overdrawn? Yes, that's correct. Um, and that their accounts were being left with... Uh, negative balances and sometimes uh, very low balances even after they'd received their Centrelink payment. Yeah, that was correct. I, I, I didn't have a full understanding of um, why some of the clients had signed up for um, overdrafts. So I, it was just a conversation that, uh, that happened in the office. Between you and the financial capability yeah, work. Yeah, but it also happened uh, with, with one of the, the workers in there as well. Um, she brought up that there. She thought she saw one of the clients have a letter that was was an opt out letter of for an overdraft. I, I asked her if if she could get me a copy of that, um, or ask the client, but I, I never received that, so I didn't pursue it any further. I see. So were you surprised to see that um, client accounts were going into negative balances? Yeah, it was. It, yeah, I, I was surprised that um, our clients would go down and apply for an overdraft. I see. And the financial capability worker that you had this discussion with. Yep. Um, is that person still with Anglican? No, she's she's moved on. Okay. But in preparing your witness statement, you've reviewed her notes. Yeah, I did. <clears throat> um, so I just reviewed her notes, and and that is part of my witness statement. And. Have you also spoken with her? Yes, just just to clarify a, a, a few points. I wasn't. Sometimes when people 
write notes, you read them, but you kind of don't understand the backstory of those notes. I see. Um, in your witness statement, you set out the position of two of Anglicare's clients on Groot. Oh, sorry, say again. In your witness statement, you set out um, the story of two of Anglicare's clients on Groot Island. Yes, that's correct. And you've not used the name of either client in your witness statement? Uh, no, I haven't. And why haven't you used the name? Uh, just for privacy. I see. Um, I'll call them client one and client two, as you have in your witness statement, without meaning to be yep. in any way disrespectful to the clients. Um, first client, client one, spoke with the financial capability worker on the 14th of December 2017. Yep, that's what was in the notes. And um, how did that person come to speak to the financial capability worker? I said in the notes that um, it was through Centrelink. And is it common that Centrelink would refer somebody to a financial capability worker? Yeah, we work very closely with Centrelink. We, we often pop in um, and meet the staff. I think last time I was there, we, we popped in and said hello. And um, yeah, we work very closely. They, they know what we do, and there's a lot of referrals back and forth. Um, why was this person referred to you by Centrelink? It was referred to... to the, sorry, to Anglicare yes. by Centrelink. Um, it, it said in the, uh, the the notes that um, that the bank, that the family, uh, the client's family would uh, commonly take um, his bank card and spend money from the client's account. So, <clears throat> as you probably heard earlier on in the week, this is a common occurrence with Aboriginal people. They um, don't really work as individual as we do, as they would call us Ballander. Um, it's not a Ballander way, it's, it's more of a sharing way. So they, they would share resources. So this is kind of a common practice that um, they would share, um, share the resource, share cards. Um, so that's, that's what's happened in this case, which is then um, you've been overdrawn. So the, um, the client's family would make use of the card to the client's Correct. account? And sometimes that would mean that Centrelink payments were being used to pay overdrawn amounts? Yes, it would obviously, um, yeah. The, the Centrelink payment, as it says in the statement there, uh, would be used uh, to pay back. And what did the financial capability worker do? Um, the financial capability worker um, took the, the, the client, um, tried to educate the client on what uh, an overdraft was, um, and tried to get the client to understand uh, what that product was. And then, obviously, um, financial capability worker um, took the client to the bank. And did this client speak English? Uh, no. So how did the financial <coughs> capability worker communicate with the client? Um, I think it was through the, uh, the Centrelink that helped with that to translate. Right. And you said the financial capability worker took the client to the bank. Yep. And did the financial capability worker establish that the client had an overdraft? <coughs> Uh, yes. And how much was that overdraft? Um, it said in her notes um, that it was uh, she, the, the account could be overdrawn uh, to a thousand dollars. See. Um, so, what did the financial capability worker and the client do at the bank? Um, it says in the <coughs> notes <coughs> that the financial capability worker um, explained to the bank teller that uh, the ability to uh, overdraw was not benefiting the client, this is what it's, it states in the notes, and asked uh, it to be switched off. And uh, something called 90% arrangement, something that you're familiar with? Um, I wasn't at the time until we started to delve into this and, and spoke to Centrelink about Centrelink payments and, and overdrafts. And do you now have an understanding of what 90% arrangements are? Yes, I do. Could you explain what 90% arrangements are? And 90% arrangement is that um, when a, an account uh, goes into overdraft and there's a Centrelink payment involved, um, that they'll only use 10% to repay back that overdraft and that the client would receive the 90%.
And is that why in the witness statement, at paragraph 25, it mentions um, a $600 debt being paid off, mm. um, but the bank was only allowed to take 10% each week? Yes, yeah, so um, trying to read into her notes, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what the outcome was. All right. Um, the second client was referred to the financial capability worker on the 30th of November 2017. Was this the same financial capability worker? Uh, yes, it is. And who referred this client? Uh, this, re this client had obviously um, come in uh, because it says there in note 28, the financial capability work and the client discuss the client's current income and expense. There could be a time when um, some budgeting or some information was shared and obviously this conversation it looks like has started um, over how to budget. That's how I read into it. There's, um, a, there's a reference in your witness statement to Groot Island and Bickerton Island Enterprises. Yep. What is that? Um, that is, uh, uh, it's, it's basically like a work for the doll scheme, and that's who we kind of partner with when it comes to um, uh, getting uh, referrals through them and clients coming in to do their activities. You commonly work with um, participants in the scheme run by that entity? Yes, that's correct. I see. Um, when the client spoke with the financial capability worker, was the client's account overdrawn? Um, in the notes, yes, it states that um, the, it was overdrawn by $310. <laughs> Did the client understand what an overdraft was? Uh, it says in the notes that the, no, the client had no such understanding. So what did the financial capability worker do on this occasion with this client? Um, it says in the notes that the financial capability worker provided some education about overdrafts and the client decided uh, to contact the bank to cancel any overdraft available on the client's account. And was the overdraft cancelled? Um, no, the, 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 it says here that, um, that they needed to go to the branch. They needed to go to the branch for what? Um, it says here in the note 26, the financial capability worker assisted the client to call the bank. The client was unable to be assisted over the phone yes. and needed to visit the branch. Right. And did they visit the branch? Uh, they did. It's about a 25-minute journey uh, into town and the what financial capability worker took the client to the bank. Where are they journeying from? Nirugu. Right. Yeah, into town. And Nigua. And uh, so they, they went to town and they went into the bank. Did the financial capability worker take the client to the bank? Uh, yes, they did. It says in my number 30, at, at the bank the client was told that it was possible to cancel the overdraft, but that because the account was locked at the time, it would be necessary to return to the bank on Friday. This must be at a later date. Um, after the client's Centrelink payment had been deposited so that the outstanding balance could be cleared. Did they return to the bank on Friday? Uh, further down the notes, it, it does state they returned to the bank. Um, and when they returned to the bank, did they successfully cancel the overdraft? Uh, my notes 30 says the capability worker assisted the client to go to the bank and take out cash from her account. 10% <clears throat> of her family benefit payment was used to pay back the overdraft. Because the client took money leaving the account overdrawn, her account remained locked until the overdraft was paid off. That's another reference to the 90% arrangements? Yeah. All right. Are there many clients that you're aware of that are on 90% arrangements on Groot Island? Um, no, I, I, I don't know of any others other than these ones. And is it something you've encountered um, in East Arnhem Land more generally? No, we have um, a Westpac branch in Nullenboy and I've never come across it around, around the Gove area. <coughs> All right. Um, what about the concept of an informal overdraft, is that a concept that you've encountered in East Arnhem Land more generally? Um, no, not really. 
uh, a lot of the other areas that we go to, there's different sorts of banks. Um, there's t TCU, and they have different arrangements. Um, so I've never, I've never come across it other than, other than me. And do you think that um, there is any benefit in an overdraft arrangement being either opt-in or opt-out? I mean, it, 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 I'm not against overdrafts. <laughs> if, if a client wants an overdraft, I think that's up to the client. Um, as long as the client's educated in what an overdraft is. Um, I think if, if there was letters that were sent out to opt out, I think that's problematic because of literacy rates and because of financial literacy understanding. Do you understand that either client one or client two opted into an overdraft? Uh, not by the notes. We couldn't uh, ascertain that because of, of language barriers. Sometimes we receive yes, yes answers, but um, it's, it's, it's comprehension and understanding what the product is. Thank you, Mr. Bowden. I have no further questions, Commissioner. I still yes, Ms. Williams. Uh, I have no further questions, Commissioner, um, as foreshadowed. Uh, with council assisting and the uh, solicitors for the commission earlier. I'm there sorry, Ms Williams, I'm losing you. I'm sorry, there are some documents I wish to tender at a convenient point, but I yes. have no questions for Mr Bowden. Yes. Thank you very much for coming, Mr Bowden. You may step down, you're excused further attendance.